Hello, friends, and welcome to Conversations with Consequences. We are the radio show and podcast of the Catholic Association, where we aim to change the culture one conversation at a time. You can listen to Conversations with Consequences on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network, Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. Eastern, or catch the Encore at 5 p.m. We are also on Sirius XM Channel 130. Of course, our radio show is always a podcast. Go to thecatholicassociation.org slash podcasts or directly to wherever you listen to your podcasts. Joining me next is Lee Sneed, one of my co-workers at uh, the Catholic Association, my co-hostess for today, for at least this section of our, sh- our this week's show of, uh, on Conversations with Consequences. We are going to talk about the new Vatican document called Dignitas Infinita, Infinite Dignity, a wonderful title for a document that, in my opinion, is long delayed in the way that it addresses certain issues that have been roiling Everyone, but in in a special way, Catholics who, you know, have to live in a complicated world and need the support of the of the church, uh, the the teaching branch of the church, no, the teaching fa- function of the church to help us understand how we ought to approach certain things using those eternal truths that the church always holds and promotes and defends. And so, very important on the infinite dignity of human beings. Welcome to the show, Lee. Thank you. So glad to be here. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. I think it it says really um, firmly some things that maybe we've heard or that we know, but it readdresses, I think, the idea and um, of what our ontological dignity, what that means, because I think a lot of people use dignity in lots of different ways, and it gets misinterpreted by everyone. Um, And so I think this explaining that just by I think Charlie Camosi put it this way, that you just by being human, you have it, you know, so we're all born, we're all created with this innate dignity. Um, And I think even something just sometimes clarifying terms is so helpful in understanding, you know, what the magisterium is teaching us. Well, let me say, Uh, so in the beginning of the document, a good part of the document has to do with understanding what human dignity means. And you use the word ontological. So they even describe four different kinds of dignity. And the most important one is ontological dignity. And I'll say what it is. It's the indelible ontological dignity is indelible and remains valid beyond any circumstances in which the person may find themselves. It cannot be lost. So as you said, it's inherent to the humanity of the person. It Mm -hmm, has nothing to do with whether they can reason or whether they're able to express themselves, whether, you know, it has nothing to do with their position in life, their circumstance, their abilities. For instance, that would include people with disabilities or mental disabilities, um, the unborn child. So ontologic meaning attached to the person, period. And the person is any human being. I think that's really, it's, it's almost to us Catholics, it seems like something, oh, of course, it applies to everybody. But let's, let's be real out there in the world. When you talk about personhood, you people are excluding persons. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) All the time. Yeah, in their in their speech and in their actions. Absolutely. People are dismissed. And, you know, I think people use, you know, just the word dignified or acting in an undignified manner, which I think sort of takes away from what the you know, what Pope Francis is saying here in terms of our ontological dignity. Mm-hmm. There, another kind of dignity is moral, and that has mm-hmm. to do with the way that people exercise their freedom, right? So human okay. beings are free to act on their will, to use their will to act in this world. They have mm-hmm. freedom. And when you lose your, you can lose your moral dignity, unlike your ontological dignity, when you use this freedom to act against the law of love. And this is sure. beautifully explained in the document. That I thought that was great. And then there is the, their social dignity, which has to do with the person's living condition. So when we say that the poor are not, they don't have dignified lives or weren't, that's because their living conditions do not, it, it contradicts their, their ontological dignity. Right. Right, Exactly. So they have all this beautiful dignity that's attached to them because they're human. But then the way they're forced to live by these, you know, by by severe poverty keeps them. um, It contradicts that beautiful dignity. And then the last one is existential. So Mm -hmm. that one to me was a little harder to understand. It has to do, I believe, when the person they they feel that their existence, they feels undignified. So it could be something like addictions or violence in the family. Illness. um, Illness. So, oh yeah, illness. And I hadn't thought of that. I'm glad you mentioned that. My father, 
<laughs> I've talked about this so much on the air, but my father died of ALS now a little over uh, some something over a year. And it, for him, it was he felt very undignified. He felt it was very undignified. And I think that's exactly right. It violated he felt violated in his dignity by by the terrible ravages of the disease. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think, too, that recalling this idea that our ontological dignity reminds us that, you know, we're embodied beings that, you know, we don't subscribe to a dualistic philosophy mm-hmm. um, that, you know, we are our bodies are an expression of who we are and we we're created that way. And as embodied beings, we're dependent um, upon one another from you know, conception till natural death. And I think for a lot of people, like you're saying, your father, I think when the tables turn and you you have to be dependent upon your baby, essentially, mm-hmm. um, it's a very, it's a very tough point in life that I think that, you know, we have to reach. But again, as embodied beings, we um, sort of take suffering as part of the package. Um, but again, the modern world likes to forget that suffering um, is a necessary part of our embodied humanity. Well, I know it sanctified my father, so... Suffering has that wonderful effect on us, and mm-hmm. and sometimes we have to thank God for it, right? Even though it's very yes. painful. You mentioned a word. You just said a word. You said relational. And part mm-hmm. of the document, and really, I, I recommend everyone to read this document. It has beautiful, it has pearls of wisdom in it all over. And one of that, one of them is the relational structure of the human person. And I'll just read a sentence. There's an ever growing risk of reducing human dignity to the ability to determine one identity and future independently of others without regard for one's membership in the human community. But human dignity also encompasses the capacity inherent in human nature to assume obligations vis a vis others. And that's, uh, I think in Catholic, in Christianity in general, in Catholicism in particular, we make, a, we, we, we make a big emphasis on the relational, uh, condition, the, 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 the relational essence of man. You know, mm-hmm. a man or a woman is most alive when they are in relationship. Number one with God, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but also with other people. Like we exist in that. And, and and that has to do also with our responsibilities. It's not just, oh, I, I feel great because I have all these wonderful people to talk to and I'm shining and I'm glowing. No, I also <laughs> have, I feel I am fulfilled in as much as I fulfill my responsibilities to others. Yeah, and that's why I think it's so great that we have the mass that you know, we don't, you know, at least a weekly reminder of that relational aspect of our being and uh, that, you know, we're not just worshiping in a quiet corner by ourselves, although obviously quiet prayer alone is very good, but, you know, we get together with, you know, the other members of our Catholic Mm -hmm. community and we celebrate the mass together. Um, And for me anyway, that is a a nice, and, you know, saying the responses, praying together is always a good reminder that we're not just in this alone. Mm -hmm. Um, Even if you have a house full of other people that also serve as a constant reminder that you're not alone. Well, one of the great plagues of uh, modern man today is his atomization, right? The way that he Mm -hmm. is very radically alone and how that destroys the the dignity of the person. We're back to dignity. I think that loneliness is an assault against our dignity because it, 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 uh, it keeps us from flourishing in relationship, which is where men and women are meant to flourish. Right. And we have, I mean, I think there's always that temptation because other people make things even messier than we can make things, um, I know, ourselves. And oh, yeah. I don't know what, so- I don't know what you're talking about, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's easier to just kind of, you know, do things on your own. And now we have this, this whole fake world where you can feel like you're connecting through screens. Um, exactly. Kind of kid, kid yourself that you're in community when, you know, there's no flesh and blood. There's, you know, you really could just be some brain in a jar somewhere. Um, you know, it's, it's not. Yeah, it's you're right. Like thing. false, like you think you're existing on a relational basis and mm-hmm. you're really not because it's so removed through a screen. And maybe also because you don't form responsibilities towards these people because they remain strangers, right? They're not Absolutely. the people around you that you have to keep getting up to rush to serve, which is what makes you human. Right. And what makes everyone mean on Twitter. Um, oh, yes. So you and your husband are both Catholic and both physicians. What do you think? Um, do you think this is going to be especially important to Catholic physicians, this document? You think it's bolstering the way you take yes, care of people? Absolutely. Because again, and as, as I think everyone has experienced it, every Catholic, every Christian has experienced 
the last few decades of the explosion of of so many ways of that are that, that are often tied to medicine i think as a cover no for some for unethical things we we need to we need explanation we need to understand and we need to we need to have that 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 backbone that the church gives us to say mm-hmm. oh no here i draw the line i won't participate in these in these unethical experiments, I won't participate in. I won't even give my my material cooperation to these unethical practices. So that's it's very hard. It's very hard as in the medical profession because it has been co opted by by the evil pro death crowd on so many right. levels, right? And, and it's, you don't even get a chance to you know use the language to explain why, right? It's all coding mm-hmm. for insurance and everything. Exactly, um, yeah. and you get you get dragged into it against your will. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about some of the some of the, the the important parts of the document that have to do with specific violations of human dignity. And the document lists a list, the uh, several, and some of them are very obvious. So there's poverty, mm-hmm. and we talked about that already. Obviously, war, which kills. Uh, it talks about migrants who are the victims of multiple forms of poverty, uh, human trafficking, and I think mm-hmm. that this that's all very very easy, very easy, understandable. No, why are these these are Violations of human dignity, sexual abuse, again, very uh, understandable. Violence against women, uh, again, understandable. Abortion, we we talk a lot on this show about abortion, I think. We do. Everybody can understand that if a, a child's life is snuffed out, that is the ultimate abuse of human dignity to take this vulnerable, innocent child who has never harmed anyone, <laughs> could never yeah. harm, harm anyone, and snuff out their lives. For yeah, from, usually, by their mother. Yeah, and usually for convenience, let's face yeah. it. Okay, so, but let's get to, oh, and I'll just mention also euthanasia and assisted suicide, which I think is pretty un, pretty clear to everyone. But the ones that, uh, and marginal... Oh, except, uh, just if I can just pause there for a second, except that they use the word death with dignity. Oh, yes, thank you. I mean, what? I mean, you know, that's, an, again, that, that sort of misuse uh, and abuse even of the of the word in that case. I mean, because people don't want to embrace that dependentness they have on other people. And um, Gil Mylander writes, I forget what the name of the essay is, but he talks about how he wants his kids. He wants to be a burden to his kids in old life. Um, Me too. You know? Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, like, it's just like, it's like, yes, of course. Like people say, I don't want to be a burden. No, he wants to be. And it's like, yes, we should all have that courage in our, you know. You well, know you know why confidence. I say me too? Because my own experience with my father, he was a mm-hmm. tremendous burden on all of us. And we bloomed and flowered and flourished. Absolutely. Carrying that burden. It was, yeah, it was painful. I cried a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I hurt for him. But wow, what a develop, what a development of our personalities and our character character and our and our virtues that we wouldn't have had the chance to absolutely to develop if it weren't for having to carry that burden. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. And the, and they do call it death with dignity. And that brings us back to what we talked about a few moments ago, which is the misunder- the misunderstanding of human dignity. So mm-hmm. the modern world out there it mischaracterizes dignity as the ability to to express your own individuality and it sure. leaves it it leaves it right there right mm-hmm. so death yeah, and with, it's all cerebral it doesn't have anything to do with the whole person as we see it anyway right so ending someone's life again like abortion or in euthanasia or assisted suicide goes contrary at its found at its foundation to ontological human dignity but it's easy it saves money it's mm-hmm. all these sort of very practical terms um, that completely ignore what you're saying, the ontological dignity of uh, us as, you know, created in God's image. And I, I don't know how to, uh, you know, how to explain that in ways that don't involve, you know, the light of Christ, um, because that's the life we live. Well, but unfortunately, anyway, well, you know, what we have found in general, you have found, I have found, people have found talking about euthanasia and assisted suicide that people really do understand the slippery slope argument. Because mm-hmm. even if they start from a point, which I think is wrong, but at least it's closer to the truth, that that people who are suffering insanely should maybe like a mercy killing, right? Like you would do mm-hmm. to your dog if they're very sick. If you start from that point, um, you could, it very easily devolves into what we're seeing in places like Canada, where they are euthanizing autistic adults, yep. um, children. Yeah. And some countries are euthanizing children. Because yeah. Well, and I think it's a good sign that that's making some headlines, you know, that it's, you know, it's not just us worrying about it, that it, if, it, if it becomes like an actual news item for the mainstream media. 
Um, I liked where you were going, though, with some of these obvious things that I think can appeal to everyone across the board. And I think this is where you're going, Gracie, but just, you know, back me up or correct me if I'm wrong. But I think surrogacy is one that gets people a little bit caught up because just like other ARTs, um, you know, they're thinking, oh, we're not aborting babies. We're making life. This is mm-hmm. great. How can this be against, you know, our human dignity? This is this is good for people who are becoming parents. People are being generous with their uteruses, you know. Um, they see it as a generosity and a gift. Like the child is yeah. a gift. A child is always a gift. So how can you say that this means of acquiring a child? Right. And I think gift. the woman, the woman's being, you know, is consensually agreed to do this or she's being, you know, compensated monetarily. Um, how can it be against her, you know, innate dignity um, to, to be just the, uh, the incubator? Well, let me give you the words. Let me give you the words from the document. Let's hear it. Because they're very, very good. Um, so this is from Pope Francis, the where they quoted him. The path to peace calls for respect for life, for every human life, starting with the life of the unborn child in the mother's womb, which cannot be suppressed or turned into an object of trafficking. In this regard, I deem deplorable the practice of so-called surrogate motherhood, which represents a grave violation of the dignity of the woman and the child, based on the exploitation of situations of the mother's and material needs. A child is always a gift and never the basis of a commercial contract. So there Gorgeous. we have some very interesting uh, concepts, right? So if the child is a gift, then it can't also be the basis of a commercial contract. Mm. There's a grave violation of the dignity of woman because she's she's being exploited most of the time mm-hmm. uh, because of her material needs. Um, the child becomes an object instead of something in itself or in his or herself you know, uh, infinitely worthy, infinitely dignified in their ontological uh, dignity. Um, Let's see, he goes, they go on, first and foremost, the practice of surrogacy violates the dignity of the child. Indeed, every child possesses an intangible dignity that is clearly expressed at every stage of his or her life, from the moment of conception, at birth, growing up as a boy or girl, and becoming an adult. Because of this unalienable unalienable dignity, the child has a right to have a fully human and not artificially induced origin and to receive receive the gift of a life that manifests both the dignity of the giver and that of the receiver. Oh, that brings tears to my eyes. (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's really beautiful. It's a really beautiful document. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think this is the crux of where people misunderstand surrogacy because Mm -hmm. they, they don't understand that for that child to have their fully human origin, but that their that their dignity, the child's dignity necessitates their fully human origin. Like we can't take away from the child's fully human origin and turn them into um, a manufactured product. Right? Yeah. Wow. On this demand. Is, on demand. And if this part finishes, the legitimate desire to have a child cannot be transformed into a right to a child. That fails to respect the dignity of the child as a recipient of the gift of life. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's really great. This, this document. Puts, this puts yeah. pay to the idea that surrogacy ever dignifies the child, right? I mean, right. it's a, it's a complete uh, violation of the ontological dignity of the child. And then they finish by talking about the dignity of woman, whether she's coerced into it or chooses to subject herself to it freely For in this practice, the woman is detached from the child growing in her and becomes a mere means subservient to the arbitrary gain or desire of others. Wow. Wow. A lot of people getting injured in this process. Mm -hmm. So the woman becomes an instrument Mm -hmm. instead of someone expressing her full ontological dignity, living living in dignity, and the horrible detachment from the child. Mm hmm. Yeah. You, uh, you, you know, you and I both have adopted children yeah. and we, we, we think very much, we consider very much their, their birth parents, especially their mothers who held them in their wombs. You know, they were, yeah. they were, they were part of their mothers and then they were detached and their mothers lost them. And that, that's a horrible hurt. Yeah. And in surrogacy, that hurt happens every time on purpose. For our children, it wasn't on purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that um, I think too, it's important to say that when we say that the child um, is robbed of that inherent dignity that comes from, you know, 
created through two sex beings, we certainly don't mean that a child who is, let's say, a, a victim of surrogacy, right? Because if they were born that way, they are God's creation too. They also have, they, they have ontological dignity. Mm -hmm. so we're not saying that. And I think that's another thing people shy away from is they're so worried that any negative talk about how a child comes into the world reflects the feelings about that child. Okay, but then, um, but then the document, is, starting with the definition of dignity, starting with the ontological dignity, there is nothing that can take away from any human right. being's dignity. Yeah. We, can, we, can, we can contradict it, right, by mm -hmm. forcing them to live in poverty or by trafficking them or by uses them, using them as surrogate mothers. Uh, so we can, we can contradict it. We can abuse it or dirty it, but we can't. Yeah. We can it. do it to ourselves by acting against our conscience. Exactly. We can yeah. uh, we can abuse our own dignity and abuse mm -hmm. the dignity of others, but we cannot obliterate it. We cannot remove it because exactly that attaches to the person because they're made in the image of God. Yeah. Wow. It, it, it makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah, it's all coming together. Um, all coming I'll also together. say, I think everyone should take a look at this document, but also the pillars coverage I found to be very interesting and very helpful. They had a few people weigh in. Charlie Camosi. Abigail Favale. I can't remember who else, but anyway, the yeah, pillars there's been very this good. is great. Yeah, the pillar's yeah. been very good on this. We only have five minutes left, so let's focus on the on the thing that's raising antennas everywhere. Uh, and that's the the very good uh, attack on gender theory uh, on mm -hmm. behalf of on behalf of the, the, the church here. So on gender theory, they start, of course, by saying that there is there is this is not this is about theory. That every human being, again, ontologically, has dignity no matter what their sexual preferences are, right? Or their sexual practices. So right. this this document, this part of the document is about theory. And um, here's a very pretty part. The church recalls that human life in all its dimensions, both physical and spiritual, is a gift from God to be accepted with gratitude and placed at the service of the good. Desiring a personal self-determination, as gender theory prescribes, apart from this fundamental truth that human life is a gift, amounts to a concession to the age-old temptation to make oneself God, entering into competition with the true God of love revealed to us in the gospel. So I guess um, this, he's, they're starting out by saying gender theory is, at, at its very foundation, a rejection of the, the beautiful truth of the human person. The, cre right. the created embodied reality of the male exactly. and the female. It's so much dualism that it can, you know, that it's something that you think or, you know, that you decide um, without any relation to your body. Um, these two separate things, um, which is one thing altogether. But then again, when you still you take this dualistic um, idea about what gender and sex mean, and then you separate it brain and body, um, but then you want to also change the body to match mm -hmm. oh, yeah. the thinking, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I like it's com it comes it's like back. going backward I, and forward over the same yes, ground. Yeah. And I, I've been thinking about that and thinking about how that exactly works. And I, I don't, I don't know, but well, I know that because at bottom, it's not, about. well, at bottom, it's not logical or rational. It has to do with these, uh, fragmented desires and fragmented personality, right? It's, sure, uh, right. And they're not considering, they're not worrying about whether or not they're being like good Cartesian dualists right? when, exactly. they're, when they're making these decisions and policies. And then, then the document goes on to talk about the fact that when gender theory erases, it attempts to erase the difference between the male and the female. And here, this is pretty, this foundational difference is not only the greatest imaginable difference, but is also the most beautiful and most powerful of them. In the, in the male-female couple, the difference achieves the most marvelous of reciprocities. It thus becomes the source of that miracle that never ceases to surprise us, the arrival of new human beings into the world. Yeah, I loved that part too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and it, it reminds you too about how with the surrogacy, uh, how, I mean, because like even in our uh, children's cases, um, you know, they were made in a natural act mm -hmm. fully, you know. And um, and the way, you know, the sexes are designed to welcome these wonderful gift babies, you know, these miraculous things that happen. It's 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 part of creation. It's part of, you know, our 
shall we say it again, uh, dignity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is pretty ontological. Only by acknowledging and accepting this difference in reciprocity between the male mm -hmm. and the female can each person fully discover themselves, their dignity and their identity. So we're mm -hmm. back to dignity. If you are male, that you can't flourish and, and you can't be fully dignified if you are, I mean, you always remain dignified. You always remain with your dignity, yes. but you're assaulting your own dignity when you when you refuse to accept your body as a gift. Yeah. And your maleness, all the beautiful specificities of masculinity, right? I know. Yeah. But now we're, it's all toxic, right? So well, no wonder people want to ditch it. I mean, I don't think it's toxic, but. I know. We love our boys. We love our, we we love love our boys, our, our young men yes. who are uh, so wonderfully masculine. And, mm. and, you know, and women with their, their, the genius of their femininity, it's really, this document is very needed in, a, in an age which is trying to erase the differences between male and female. They go, the document goes on uh, to talk about sex changes and, and how this is just an assault, a total assault on, on the dignity of the person because the soul and the body both participate in that dignity and, and characterize both the soul and the body characterize the, 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 the human person fully, like all right. through and through in all their cells, you know, in every pore of their minds. So we're out of we're out of time. We could talk about this for another two hours. I know. I thank you for for joining me, Lee. And to our thank listeners, you. you can look at you can Google it. It's called Dignitas Infinita. You can put PDF and and it's really really worth reading. And and thank you to the church. I'd like to say for yeah giving us a wonderful document to 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 quiet our anxieties and 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 back us up when. We need to go out there and be Joan, Jones of Arc or, <laughs> or St. Ignatius Loyola, right? Right. It's not always easy. <laughs> thank you, Lee. All right. Thank you, Gracie. Joining me next is John Birch, an old friend of the show. He's attorney. He's an attorney at uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom. We're going to talk about a very important case that'll be up before the, the will be argued before the Supreme Court next week. It has to do with something called MTALA. Let me give you what that means. That's the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. So welcome to the show, John. Thank you. So great to be back. So that's sort of a mouthful. We'll we'll call it MTALA from now on, but. I wanted to say it, I wanted to give all the, the words because part of it is the Active Labor Act. And it's a very interesting federal law that was passed in, in, the, in 1986. Tell us all about it, please, John. Give us, give us the, the, the short version of EMTALA and what the Biden administration has tried to do with this great federal law. Sure. EMTALA was a bipartisan law that was enacted by Congress in the 1980s. President Reagan signed it into law, and it was addressing a very specific problem. Uh, sometimes if uh, an indigent person, no money, no insurance, showed up at a hospital emergency room and they were in critical condition, the hospital would not take them in and provide them care or find another facility that could care for them. Uh, they would just be dumped. Mm -hmm. And so EMTALA became known as an anti-patient dumping statute. But EMTALA is part of the Medicare Act, which is a really big statute that controls what hospitals can and cannot do when they accept federal money, which almost all of them do. And EMTALA is, you can think about it like a house built on a foundation. And that foundation is the state regulation of the practice of medicine. So the Medicare Act specifically says that none of its provisions should be construed such that a federal employee, an officer, is regulating the practice of medicine. And so all EMTALA does is require you to treat someone who's in need, but it doesn't require you to offer treatments that aren't otherwise available at the hospital. And that could be because you don't have enough room, you know, your beds are full, that would be a reason. It may be because you don't have the specialty that they require. There's a famous Ninth Circuit case where there was a small rural hospital without a, a mental health ward and someone needed mental health treatment and they couldn't provide it. And the court said, well, that's fine because it wasn't available. But it also applies to things that aren't available as a result of the state regulation of medical practice. And in um, Idaho, uh, who's on the other side of this case, they have a Defense of Life Act, which was enacted in 2020 
to protect the lives of women and their unborn children by preventing doctors from performing abortions unless necessary to save the life of the mother. So for years, everyone understood EMTALA the same way. You have to treat everybody the same, but you don't have to provide a treatment that state law prohibits or you otherwise don't have available. And then Dobbs came along. And initially, President Biden said, well, now all the states get to decide what their abortion laws will be. And then very shortly after that, he said, well, no, on second thought, this EMTALA law requires doctors to perform abortions in the emergency room if that's an appropriate stabilizing treatment. And no one had ever thought that before. And the administration sued Idaho and persuaded a federal court to enjoin their pro-life law and to allow abortion enclaves in hospital emergency rooms that are funded by Medicare. And so that's the crux of what the Supreme Court will be hearing next week. So, John, when I went to medical school, I trained at a, a very busy public hospital in Miami, and Mtala had just been passed, maybe four years earlier when I started my medical school training and I worked for on and off. I worked at the on the labor floor and I knew Mtala and I heard it talked about because in our public hospital, we took care of all the the indigent and uninsured women of Miami who were giving birth. So they all ended up in our hospital because we were the only public facility before Mtala. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. We had them all. Uh, so and it was a crazy labor floor. It was uh, we didn't there were no epidurals. Because, you know, the epidurals are expensive and the pain won't kill you. So so it was a crazy place. Anyway, the point is, I heard stories about the times before Emtala. So before Emtala, just a few years earlier, when a woman who was indigent or uninsured would show up at one of the private hospitals of Miami in active labor, and that's part of the law, active labor, uh, she could be turned away. And so she would have to get back in a car or a taxi or a bus to make her way back to make her way to us at the public hospital where we would receive her and she could give birth. So imagine the danger of that situation of being in full active labor, maybe just a few minutes from birth and being turned away at a private hospital. So Mtala solved that. Um, and so Mtala is a great, uh, a great uh, part of Medicare, right? And it prevents, it, is. it prevents emergency rooms from turning away people on their doorsteps who are bleeding out or about to give birth or <laughs> whatever that right. situation that could be. Exactly what it was supposed to do and what everybody understood it to do until the Biden administration reinterpreted it after Dobbs. So imagine that you're working at your hospital down there in Miami and instead of a pregnant woman coming in in, in labor because we want to take it out of the abortion context, imagine that the indigent woman needed a kidney transplant mm -hmm. in order to stabilize her. And there happened to be another patient in the, the stall next to her in the emergency room, and she had an extra kidney. You can just go in and take it because Amtala requires you to stabilize the first woman. Oh. Or even if the second <laughs> that, patient was that willing... That doesn't seem fair, John. <laughs> no, or, or even if the second patient was willing to donate it, you likely have a state medical board that decides who is entitled to get a kidney transplant. Maybe it should go instead to a, you know, a, a 20 year old young woman who has a long life ahead of her instead of a, a patient who's already in her late seventies and has terminal cancer uh -huh. because the state medical board determines that, that, that kidney has a better use. Uh -huh. Well, the, the hospital isn't required by Impala to make the, the kidney transfer just because that's a stabilizing treatment. It takes the regulation of the state practice of medicine as it finds it. Or, you know, another example, if, if Florida prohibited marijuana and a doctor thought that marijuana would be the best stabilizing treatment for someone who came in with a really intense pain, they wouldn't be obligated to do that because state law prohibits it. And TALA always takes state licensing standards and what doctors are allowed to do or not do in a state as it finds them. And it doesn't create obligations that conflict. And here, both of the laws are life affirming. Obviously, as you described, Mtala, it had helped those women who were in labor. Idaho's Defense of Life Act is also life affirming. And so there shouldn't be any conflict. And there certainly shouldn't be a, a mandate to violate state law by giving an abortion that's prohibited. So the strange uh, schizophrenic aspect of this, to me, reading it, reading the, the, the Biden administration's brief, is that the administration or the Department of Justice is trying to take a life-saving law and turn it into a mandate for abortion, which, correct me if I'm wrong, but it would seem to run counter against many states' uh, defense of life uh, regulations and laws. 
Absolutely. Idaho is just a test case for them, but they've also promulgated regulations that require this in every state that has a pro-life law. And that would include states unlike Idaho, which have just bans on late-term abortions. Um, you know, say someone was at 25 weeks um, and a, a state law prohibited any abortions after 22 weeks when the baby was viable. Um, the government would say that they have to perform abortions too. And, and what's really curious um, really sad about the government's position, besides the fact that it was manufactured to respond to Dobbs after 40 years of everyone agreeing what Amtala meant, is that Amtala has a provision that defines an unborn child as a patient that's entitled to treatment as well. And so they're taking a, a law that Congress specifically used to recognize the importance of safeguarding the life of an unborn child and turning it into a weapon to take it. The, the government's brief describes two or three uh, situations which they say would require an abortion on an emergency basis. And I would say as a physician, is that's completely wrong. So for instance, they mention uh, preeclampsia, which is when a woman, a pregnant woman has, has dangerously high blood pressure. The treatment for that is delivery of the child, which is not an abortion. So they, in that point, they conflate abortion with a proper medical treatment which is delivery, which may result in the child who doesn't survive because it might be too early in the pregnancy or the child's development, but is not an abortion. So I, do you agree with that? That's how I read the, the DOJ brief as conflating proper medical treatments with abortion and in a way that's not understood by the, either the medical profession or just, you know, more widely by the public. That's exactly right. And, and, and the, the administration's view Abortion is always the necessary treatment. So say that you had a, a woman who came in and she was 18 weeks pregnant and she had a premature rupture of her membranes. And that's a very serious condition for mom and the baby. Um, you know, for the mom, it's possible that she could develop an infection, which could be fatal. Um, and obviously it, it's very dangerous for the baby if there's no amniotic fluid anymore. But in some of those instances, when you have that premature rupture, it's possible to wait and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and there was an example in Idaho where a mom at 18 weeks had her premature rupture of membranes. And rather than asking for an abortion or, or suggesting an abortion, the doctor said, well, let's wait and see. We'll take your temperature. We'll monitor your white blood cell count. We'll have a prescription for um, you know, anti-infection in case you need that. But let's just wait. And she didn't end up having any problems. And she was able to carry that baby in good health all the way to 23 weeks, at which point it was delivered, and mom and baby were fine. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly the way that the Defense of Life Act and EMTALA are supposed to work together to protect, protect them both. But there's two patients. And yet the Biden administration's position would be that the doctor should have ordered an abortion immediately as soon as the woman walked into the hospital with this medical issue. And it just shows that abortion is not the only way to treat someone who's having a, a medical problem. And oftentimes it's the exact wrong thing to do. But the Biden administration's goal here, I think, is even more nefarious than that, um, because a mental health condition can be a serious medical condition. And so if a, a woman before viability or after viability you know, could show up at the emergency room and say, I'm so depressed about having this baby that if I I'm forced to have the baby, I might kill myself. And in the Biden administration's view, that would then liberate the doctor to say, oh, here's your mifepristone and your mifepristol, you can have an abortion. Whereas Idaho would say, let's treat the mental health problem, but you can't have the abortion because it's not necessary to save the mother's life. And we want to protect them both. The Biden administration is looking to use Amtala as an abortion enclave in pro-life states in every emergency room where the hospital accepts Medicare dollars. And because it's all in the, the Biden administration's view up to the doctor's judgment, that means abortion on demand, you know, plain and simple. You, you've you really shocked me, John. I hadn't, I hadn't imagined that scenario. That's absolutely heinous <clears throat> that, mm -hmm. that that could. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it's heinous, because as a physician, I know many physicians of all different stripes, emergency room doctors, radiologists. I mean, we come in all flavors, but most of us do not participate in abortion and we refuse to participate in abortions. This is true even of OBGYNs because mm -hmm. in, as a doctor, as doctors, we are trained in the defense and protection and enhancement of human life. So 
to try to co-opt all of us because that's basically what will happen, right? If, if you're the radiologist working in an emergency room, you're, you're going to be suddenly pulled into abortions in progress in the ER. And that's not what we do we, as radiologists. We don't participate in abortions in progress right. as, as a whole. And, and, and those poor emergency room physicians having to be, I mean, just having, forget, you know, people say, well, pro-life doctors. I, I would propose that m the vast majority of doctors are pro-life in that sense. Like maybe they're not out with placards yeah. in front of the Supreme Court, but they are engaged in the defense and promotion of human life. That's the that's their vocation. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and you can imagine the situation with a, a pro-life OBGYN who might spend most of their time on the labor and delivery floor, but they're a hospitalist. And so they also will come down to the emergency room to help with a pregnant woman's emergencies. And, and she may have already spoken to the hospital administration about her conscience and got an exemption from all the right people. And she's up there on the eighth floor in the labor and delivery unit. And all of a sudden the call comes in. There's a woman who's pregnant and she's in distress in the emergency room. And she comes down. And as she's scrubbing up, she doesn't know whether she's dealing with a patient who's having a miscarriage or some other problem with the pregnancy or whether she just took mifepristol and this is the completion of an abortion. And so as she confronts that situation, even if she has the exemption, she doesn't have time to go back to the hospital administrator and say, oops, turned out this wasn't a miscarriage or an ectopic pregnancy. It was an abortion. I can't participate in this, even though the woman's bleeding. Can we find someone else to do it? You know, and, and because, like you said, all doctors are motivated to protect and preserve life, she's going to do what she can to help the woman. But in the process, she'll have been co-opted to participate in an abortion that deeply violates her con conscience. And yet that's what the Biden administration seems to be all about. When, when a woman comes to the ER, for instance, and she's in, in process of miscarrying, whether it's natural or provoked by mifepristone, if the child has a heartbeat still and and hasn't it begun to emerge and the cervix is closed, any, that child has a right, that a child is alive and, and could very well continue and, and be born later. Making emergency room doctors interfere in that specific case, I think is exactly what the Biden administration wants to do. And the, and the, the, their interference would be a formal abortion, a surgical abortion. And there's yes. and there's really no need for that because if the woman is on is uh, has uh, is bleeding, she can be transfused. And then, of course, if the point comes where her life is in danger, then in Idaho and in every other state, then the physician can step in and sadly remove that life, right? Because yeah, that's what the exactly. woman needs. Because the the states and the Catholic Church don't even recognize that situation as an abortion where the primary purpose is to save the mother's life. And it's not an intentional taking of the child's life that's exempted from the definition of abortion in every single state. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, the Biden administration wants to have more abortions and they want to coerce pro-life doctors to violate their conscience, as we were talking about. But I think most of all, with this reinterpretation of Mtala, they're trying to give pro-abortion doctors who want to prescribe mifepristone, who want to perform abortions, a, an enclave in pro-life states like Idaho or Texas or Mississippi or Alabama, where they can continue to take babies' lives, even though Mtala itself treats the unborn child as a second patient. Well. John, thank you for joining us. And I really, really hope I, I, I'll pray and I hope that all our listeners will pray along that uh, cooler heads prevail and, and logic and sense and, and just compassion and generosity at the Supreme Court and that the ADF and Idaho win their case. That's our prayer as well. And, and for those who want to pray specifically while the argument is happening, it will begin shortly after 10 a.m., on Wednesday, April 24th, and we will take all the prayers that we can get. And now Father Roger Landry offers a short and inspiring homily for this Sunday's Gospel. This is Father Roger Landry, and it's a joy for me to be with you. As we enter into the consequential conversation, the risen Lord Jesus wants to have with each of us this Sunday. The fourth Sunday of Easter each year is called Good Shepherd Sunday, because on this day the Church focuses on the 10th chapter of the Gospel of St. John, which Jesus reveals the relationship he has with each of his faithful followers. Jesus first self-discloses, I am the Good Shepherd. He reveals the way he seeks to relate to us. And that self-revelation leads to a disclosure about who we really are. We are his people, 
the sheep of his flock. We respond with some of the most famous words God has ever inspired, saying, the Lord is my shepherd. I want, I lack for nothing. We mark this truth in the heart of the Easter season each year because it is the heart of our Easter joy. With the risen Lord as our shepherd, with our being his beloved sheep, we truly have it all. But it's key for us to believe and live by these famous words of Psalm 23. By them we publicly confess as Catholics that our true treasure is Jesus, that if we have him but don't have everything else in the world, we still recognize how rich we are. In the midst of a consumerist society in which we're bombarded with advertisements that pretend we'll only be happy if we obtain what they're selling, that we'll only be fulfilled if we have money and houses, fame, fortune, power, and position, we focus instead on Jesus the Good Shepherd, risen from the dead as the pearl of great price. The Lord is our shepherd. With him we lack nothing. We confess that what Jesus provides, the relationship we have with him, is far more fundamental to happiness in this world and absolutely essential to eternal felicity with him in the eternal sheepfold than anything and everything else. Throughout the Good Shepherd discourse, Jesus gives us in the 10th chapter of St. John roughly a different third of which we get every year, Jesus reveals that he does for us essentially three things. For us to be good sheep of the good shepherd, we need to allow him to shepherd us and transform us in these three ways. First, Jesus calls us by name, knows us, and leads us out. He knows his sheep and his sheep know him, he says. We're not a number, just one of a vast multitude. We're unique to him. He knows our story. He knows us like no other. He knows our strengths and weaknesses. And we're called to know him in return, to live in relationship with him, to relate to him, for example, like Mary and the saints, like Mary Magdalene and so many reconciled sinners. And knowing us as he does, he calls us. He gives us a vocation to be his. We hear his voice and recognize it. And that call is not a one-time summons, but rather Jesus is our good shepherd, guides us always. We not only have to hear that call, but need to follow it, to follow the Good Shepherd as he leads us down sometimes dark valleys, sometimes onto verdant pastures, and ultimately to the eternal sheepfold. This is the first characteristic of him as our shepherd and ourselves as his sheep, the personal relationship he, risen from the dead, wants to have with you and me. Second, as Good Shepherd, he lays down his life for us. He says, no one takes my life from me. I freely lay it down. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. That's what he does in his passion, death, and resurrection. He does all of this because he loves us. He told us during the Last Supper, no one has greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. And that's the type of love he has for us, freely and willingly giving his life so that we might not perish but have life with him. He loves us so much that he will leave the 99 behind to come after us doesn't want us to be lost, but each of us, he deems, worth risking and giving his life for. The third characteristic is that he gives us eternal life. He puts us securely in his Father's strong hands. He protects us from thieves and marauders and promises that if we remain with him, we'll never perish. He not only saves us from so many dangerous and difficult situations, including eternal perils, but wants to give us the greatest gift of all time, eternal life, through coming into communion with him who is the resurrection and the life. Jesus the Good Shepherd continues to befriend, call, and guide us, to defend and lay down his life for us, to save us and give us eternal life, but does it for the most part by calling some of his sheep and making them effective shepherds. He takes disciples and makes them apostles and guardians. He wants to do this with each of us. If we're good sheep, then he wants us to become in our own circumstances good shepherds of others, someone who helps Jesus feed, guide, and protect others in his name. This is what happens in the lives of young people who become parents. This is what occurs when older brothers and sisters mature and care for their younger siblings. This is what occurs when godparents are faithful to their responsibility. This is what is supposed to happen in every Christian as we look out at family members, friends, peers, colleagues, so many who are like sheep without a shepherd. For a good sheep of Jesus, he wants us to become with him good shepherds of the rest, leading them to come to know him and enter into relationship with him as their good shepherd with whom we'll want for nothing else. We see this transformation, for example, in the vocation of St. Peter. After the resurrection, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the seashore of Galilee, Jesus asked Peter three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Three times Peter responded, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And after each 
response, Jesus gave him a commission, a task that would be the bedrock of all he would do in Jesus' name. First commission was feed my lambs, telling him in particular to care for Christ's young people. Second, tend my sheep, which in the Greek means to guard and guide. Third was feed my sheep. Jesus the Good Shepherd was entrusting the care and nourishment of his flock, young and old, to Peter's loving solicitude. They would always remain Christ's sheep. Jesus said, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. But they would be guided by a sheep like themselves whom Christ would choose a point in hell to be a shepherd after his own loving heart. And it's obvious that St. Peter never forgot this lesson. Peter's love for Jesus, as well as our love for Jesus, would be shown in how we love those whom Jesus loves. Jesus wants us to know them by name and lead them to him, to help them recognize his voice and follow him. He wants us to sacrifice ourselves for them so that they may become beneficiaries of his own sacrifice. Like Christ, we have the power to lay down our time, our money, even our life, trusting in Jesus' power to raise us up again. Jesus wants us to help others seize the eternal life he gives and protect them from the spiritual and eternal con men who are all around us trying to preach a different gospel and way of salvation than Jesus the Good Shepherd has given. We all have that vocation as good sheep of the Good Shepherd to imitate his shepherdly love. But on this Good Shepherd Sunday, for the last 61 years, the church has always marked the World Day of Prayer for Vocations, focusing especially on one group of disciples whom the Lord is summoning in a particular way to be shepherds in his image. It's on this day that we unite ourselves to the Pope and to Catholics all across the world in praying to God the Father, the Harvest Master, to send out priest laborers, true shepherds, into the fields and among the flocks. Priests are the Good Shepherd's indispensable instrument to feed his flock with himself and the Holy Eucharist. But they also nourish us with his Holy Word and the teaching of the Church. Priests guide Jesus' flock one-on-one -on -one in the ministry and the confessional, in spiritual direction and counseling, and guide the entire flock in their work as pastors, the Latin word for shepherd. They also seek to protect the flock of Christ from what Jesus calls in the Sunday's Gospel thieves and marauders, those who would seek to harm them, those who would want to profit from them by metaphorically shearing, milking, killing, and eating them. Having heard Jesus calling them by name, priests lay down their lives for Jesus and for his flock, seeking to help them enter into a communion with Jesus, the resurrection of life from which no one will be able to take them from the Father's hand. On the World Day of Prayer for Vocations, we thank Jesus for the way that he has fed and tended us as his lambs and sheep throughout our whole life by those who love Christ enough to leave a family their own, money and possessions in their own will in order to serve us with their prayer, with the sacraments, with their charity, and with their whole life in communion with the poor, chaste, and obedient Christ. We pray in a particular way on Good Shepherd Sunday, in an age in which the church and the world is yearning for real leadership, that God may hear our prayers and raise up many such shepherds from among the boys of our families, parish families, and for me, chaplaincies. It's a day to pray to the Good Shepherd for all those who have already responded to his call, that they may think not of themselves and profit from the sheep, but of the sheep and offer themselves fully. Jesus is the Good Shepherd who never leaves his flock untendered. He continues to feed, lead, and protect us, he continues to nourish, guide, and defend us in a particular way through the priests he makes pastors after his own heart. As we prepare to listen to the Good Shepherd's voice speaking to us in the Gospel this Sunday, we ask him to make us ever more grateful for the table he has prepared for us and for the priesthood that uniquely makes this great banquet of life possible. We ask him to make us ever more attentive to, the, to his voice speaking to us through the church so that we may know how to follow him through his priests all the way to the verdant pastures and the sheepfold of heaven. God bless you. Thank you, Father. To learn more about Father Landry, check out his website. It's called catholicpreaching.com. And make sure to catch his writings at EWTN's National Catholic Register, where he's a regular contributor. With that, I leave you. And thank you again for being our listeners. And we continue to pray for you always. Thank you.